Hey, how's it going out there, folks? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're at here on this fine Tuesday. It is March 18th, 2025, 725 a.m. here in California time. Uh, latest activity on the Earthquake 3D globe looks like uh, some movement out around Oklahoma with a 2.2 earthquake coming into that region. Now, uh, got a little bit of earthquake activity to chat about in California, so let's go ahead and check that out real quick. It's occurring right off the Hayward Fault, in between the Hayward Fault and the Calaveras Fault Zone. Let me double check, make sure everything's recording here, which it is. And, uh, well, last night here, we got a little bit of activity stirring up here around the Bay Area with a 3.9 earthquake shaking things out here outside of Hayward to the east, about six miles deep here underneath the area. Uh, since then, a number of twos, a number of ones, upper twos, the latest, a 2.4, a little bit further up north here uh, on the northern edge of the Calaveras Fault Zone. Now, you know, we've been talking about this for a little while here in terms of elevated earthquake activity around the Bay Area, uh, specifically on the Hayward Fault, the San Andreas Fault here, and the Calaveras Fault. And it's a sign here, just like every other... Um, instance here in the past few months of elevated earthquake activity across California. Uh, things are getting tight. They're getting strained out here. Um, if we look back at the last, now I pulled up the last year here of 2.0 and above around the Bay Area. The Hayward Fault uh, has been quite active out here with numerous swarms on it um, across pretty much the entire length here of the uh, Hayward Fault. Uh, got a pretty decent amount of threes there back in February. Not to mention today's activity over here within the last 24 hours. And it, uh, it's starting to paint a little picture here of increasing potential for larger quake activity across this region. Of course, the Hayward Fault and the Calaveras Fault are separate faults that branch off the San Andreas Fault, which is a plate boundary. But the plate boundary itself here in San Francisco has been noting a uh, increasing earthquake um, event out here as well. Um, there is a little potential here. If you look up north, there's a Rogers Creek Fault, which has been somewhat active as well here across the northern end. And you say, uh, one may say, wow, um, you know, that's just north here of the Hayward Fault. There's actually, uh, they believe there's a connection here between the Rogers Creek Fault and the Hayward Fault. Uh, this was an, uh, a little article put out in 2016 where scientists found definitive evidence that the Rogers Creek Fault and the Hayward Fault are linked together underneath uh, San Pablo Bay. So if that is the case, then that would make this entire fault system you know, obviously, you know, more um, lengthy, right? 118 miles um, would be known as the, uh, the Hayward Fault as a whole. So they're thinking about renaming the Rogers Creek Fault, retiring it, and that the entire 118 mile fault to be known as the Hayward Fault. So if that's the case, then we're looking at a bigger potential of a larger earthquake activity um, with the with the uh, uh, rupture here of the Rogers Creek Fault and the Hayward Fault as as a one, and that's a scary thought there because uh, a 7.4 obviously is more a, a little bit more powerful earthquake compared to what they've had here um, in recent past back in 1868. That there was a recorded 7.0 on the Hayward Fault. So 7.4, much larger. A little scary. And it's been showing a lot of activity here recently. This isn't the only area. You know, we if you watch these videos, I'm talking about Southern California, talking about Seattle. All along the West Coast here, we've seen a lot of elevated activity. But this is just the most recent one right now. Um, the last earthquake, 1868. Average intervals here. Let me show you guys real quick. Um, go back down here a little bit. I've covered this quite a bit, but I want to show you guys the average interval window, which is about 140 years for uh, earthquake activity. Right here. There we go. Uh, earthquakes associated with the radiocarbon dating that uh, they use to figure out when last past earthquakes occurred. Uh, average intervals here about 140 years on the Hayward Fault. Uh, note that 2018 is 150 years from the last major event on the Hayward Fault, which is 1868, the seven-pointer. 
Uh, the longest time was 160 year period between 1470 and 1630. So here we are, right? Um, 2018 was 150 years from the last major event and the longest time span was 160 years. We are, I'm telling you what, we're coming into a period here where uh, it's going to be happening probably pretty soon. Either uh, we're going to see a full rupture of the Hayward Fault or maybe just, you know, a, a seven-pointer. But either way, a uh, an earthquake of a 7.0 or 7.4 in the Bay Area would be quite disastrous because of the population density out here. If you check out the USGS map population density, well, you know, the San Francisco Bay is just a concrete jungle out here, and the fault system runs directly through the East Bay, which would include areas of Oakland. Let me bring this down a little bit. Um, Oakland, Berkeley, Richmond, Hayward, Fremont, all these areas down there. It's just a populated, uh, it, it's crazy down there. I mean, to some that's perfect, but uh, not to me. That's absolutely too much uh, population density out there for me. But it is a Hayward, the Hayward Fault is right there, runs right through the town, uh, many different areas, and it is, uh, it's definitely active here, folks, um, with this activity that's happening just off of it here. Um, it looks like they have it in between the Calaveras Fault and the Hayward Fault, but as I showed you guys here on the map, it's been quite active over the last year, up and down the board with swarms on it. Today's recent activity, they're just a sign of pressurization in the area. Sometimes we'll see that pressure transfer um, from a fault system that's really tight and just about ready to pop, and we'll see that uh, pressure kind of transfer off of there a little bit on nearby faults and it's showing here across the northern end of the Calaveras Fault. So I believe here we're coming into a time that uh, uh, we, sh we should see an earthquake on this system um, and if it if it comes down to that scientists are correct here linking the two, the Rogers Creek Fault and the Hayward Fault, well then you know the potential for that larger earthquake exists out here with a 7.4 for that entire length of those two fault systems so it's it's happening folks we're getting uh, i think we're getting pretty close here and the best thing to do is make sure you're prepared for it but uh, as i've said here numerous times this is not the only area uh, seeing earthquake activity on the increase up in seattle right south of seattle uh, we got some activity stirring up there last night and this morning 3.2 that is uh south of the hayward or the uh, seattle fault north of tacoma I believe this is the area that's had a little bit of earthquake activity here in the last 30 days. Uh, let's go ahead and look here. Actually, it's in an area that has not had earthquake activity. So we're just starting to fill in out here. The Seattle Fault over the last 30 days has been pretty active on the west side and the east side here. That is capable of producing a 7.5 earthquake directly underneath Seattle. That uh, is more hazardous uh, than the Cascadia mega quake over here. And I say that because of proximity, right? Seattle's not on top of Cascadia here. If it was, yeah, there, it, it wouldn't be a good scenario, but it's a ways away from the Cascadia, so they will feel the mega quake when it happens across the Cascadia, but the Seattle fault is more dangerous to the Seattle area because it runs directly underneath the, the fault system runs directly underneath Seattle. So uh, elevated activity across the Pacific Northwest, um, numerous swarms up here as well there's there's definitely a uh, um, a pattern so to speak out here of increasing pressure along the west coast out here and we've gotta gotta be prepared folks whether that means we're gonna see a, a cascadia rupture or maybe both a good possibility it's possible that the cascadia can trigger the san andreas fault down here or vice versa so we'll have to watch and see uh, how this plays out but just be prepared, folks. Um, no one knows the exact date when it's going to happen, but you have to take into account these little hints, right? Mother Nature throwing out some hints at us, so just be on guard. Southern California down here, uh, some further activity on the Malibu Coast Fault. This is another area that's been just been seeing a lot more earthquake activity than years past, a lot more. And the article here that Dr. Lucy Jones put out on her Blue Sky social network and also Facebook and whatever else she uses here is an interesting little note here that uh, the Malibu area in the last year or so 
has seen 12 uh, 3.0 or larger quakes. Now that's a considerably higher number than what they had experienced 25 years in a 25 year period where the Malibu area had just seven uh, M 3.0 or higher in that same location. So right there, that's a, that's a huge increase. I don't know the percentage wise, but that's a major increase in elevated earthquake activity in the Malibu area. And as I say along well, the, the entire time, sometimes I have to correct the comments in here because I see them all the time. Well, these three pointers and four pointers, all they're doing is just relieving the strain. You know, they're preventing us from getting the big one. <clears throat> you couldn't be more wrong than that. Small quakes do not prevent big quakes. In fact, it takes 1,000 3.0s to relieve the stress of just one M5. How crazy is that? Uh, and it does slightly increase the chance of more just because the rate is up. So listen, look at this here. As a seismologist with almost 50 years experience looking at quakes, I am thinking, how interesting. I wonder what will be next. Isn't that an interesting statement from a seismologist here? So, you know, what could be next, right? The simple answer is a big quake. So that, and that's down in Malibu. That's just one area of many regions out here that has seen a lot of earthquake activity in increasing movement. And I tell you, when the movement here is increasing, uh, that's the time for a possibility of a bigger quake to happen anywhere out here across the California region, Pacific Northwest. You know, it could, it could be pointing towards a San Andreas Fault here earthquake and also along with the Cascadia. That uh, would be the worst case scenario. So just be on guard, folks. Um, Let's see what we got here across the rest of the globe. Largest magnitude real quick is a 5.8 from yesterday. Today so far, um, 5.3 across the southern end. Uh, I believe that's a Mariana Trench here. It is. So that's a pretty shallow earthquake. Nothing big, but a 5.3 so far after midnight. A pretty good cluster of quakes here across the Indonesia area. But uh, Aside from that, let's see what we got here across the Nankai Trough. That's still not showing any mega quake activity, and it's coming up here. We, I think we're just building up here to the next big one out here. The question is, is it going to be here across the West, West Pacific, or is California going to get hit? It's a uh, kind of a waiting game, and again, no one knows exactly um, what is going to happen out here or where, but... Uh, the signs are starting to show out here. Oil fields out in Texas and Oklahoma getting hit. Nothing major. Uh, let's see. Let's check out space weather real quick here. And pretty quiet, folks, as expected. I've been calling it. I've been calling it here for the last few days that things are going to remain quiet out here. Not looking at any elevated solar flare activity due to, well, the sunspots not wanting to be active. There's numerous sunspots out here, but as I've said before, you could have a hundred sunspots on the sun facing the earth and it'd look crazy. One would think the world is ending, but if there's not complexity within that magnetic structure of the sunspots, well, guess what? You don't get that special spark called a solar flare. Uh, for severe weather today, just a, looks like a minor risk up there in uh, eastern Nebraska into Iowa for a um, little large hail threat up there today. Nothing big. No wind or tornado events. Um, tomorrow a little bit uh, a little bit more active to the northeast there, but really nothing major <clears throat> in the forecast for now compared to well, the last week or so, all those tornadoes down south. It even looks like there is something coming up here on day six. They're already issuing a severe potential 10% across Texas and the uh, uh, Louisiana area. That's day six for Sunday uh, this coming weekend here. So interesting. All right. Um, what else is there, folks? I think that's about it. There's, a again, a lot of information here that one could go over. Um, but we have to, there's so much time that has passed since the lar last large earthquake activity. I think a lot of people here have gotten complacent in their daily lives, you know, just trying to focus on making money and getting work, raising the family, paying off your loans and your credit cards. Well, this right here could really put a damper in um, 
a lot of uh, a lot of that uh, focus that too many people are complacent on. I know, you know, but 160 years, the longest time was 160 years. Our 160 year um, time period from the Hayward Fault, the, la the last big earthquake there will be in 2028, but that's the longest time period. The average year is 140 years, and that was back in 2018. So it's a toss up right now. You could flip a coin and, and we could have an earthquake today on the Hayward Fault that would, um, you know, be quite devastating. And these very well may be foreshocks to something bigger coming here soon. So just be on guard, folks. The best thing to do is, uh, for one, download the MyShake app. I am not associated with it, but man, is it a beneficial app. It saves, uh, it gives you about 10 to 20 second time frame between when the earthquake happens out here and the time to expect the shaking. So, I, I, you know, anywhere out here in California, one should have that on their phone. That's a necessity. Whether you're at, you're at work or in the car, that kind of gives you time to make some emergency adjustments uh, before a big earth before you start feeling the shaking of a big earthquake. So, anyway, um, we'll catch you guys out here a little bit later on this evening, folks. Uh, just play it safe and have an earthquake plan. We'll see you guys out here a little bit later on this evening. Take care.